We are recording. All right, let's keep it clean now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how would you like to get this started? Um, Excellent. Do you want me to just Here's jump Marty in? Marty Feldman, our section chairman. There you go. Thank you, Marty. Why don't you begin? Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our January meeting of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers New England section. Um, we're open to all around the world. This is free and uh, free education. And uh, tonight we're uh, very happy to return to a subject we haven't covered in, uh, I would say, years. Probably the last time uh, we touched on it was something on purely media asset management. And uh, to that now, uh, we add uh, storage. Uh, if you do any kind of production, whether it's video, film, uh, photo, audio, uh, very quickly, you're gonna find you're gonna need two things. You're gonna need a place to keep it, whether that's locally or in the cloud, uh, and uh, a way to access it in an intelligent way. And uh, that's what we're gonna be discussing tonight. Uh, in modern video production workflows require both on-premise and on off-premise accessibility. And uh, uh, the company SNS, Studio Network Solutions, has come up with uh, uh, some very intelligent ways of doing just that. And uh, with us tonight from SNS is the, the Director of Sales, Steve McKenna. And uh, we're gonna be turning this over to him and uh, he's gonna give us a, a thorough a very, very thorough look at this. Uh, Steve, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Marty. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to get to speak to a SMPTE chapter. Um, I know many of you have a lot of experience in doing this and we've certainly seen our industry uh, change, whether that's how content is created or delivered. Now, the good news is we're creating more content than ever. So. We've seen video propagate into even very non-traditional uh, spaces. Uh, we'll certainly be reviewing some of that here today as well. So yeah, what, as Marty said, uh, modern workflows are becoming more and more complicated, uh, whether that be the fact that apparently these global pandemic things happen and we all have to run home and figure out how to continue continuity of service and keep putting out content and getting things to air. Um, whether that be managing our assets across these new tiers and getting remote functionality. And at SNS, we believe the best way to accomplish this really is not necessarily to jump ship and try to do everything in the cloud or try to do everything on prem and violate lockdown orders and sneak in at night so that we can get stuff done, but to really embrace a hybrid workflow, to use each type of storage in each tier of where our assets are for what it's best suited to, not to shoehorn everything into one or the other. So what we're gonna be reviewing today is on-premise and remote media production workflows, obviously specifically for film and television, as we sit with the uh, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Um, quick little agenda here, start off with some stuff that I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, but it's always good to, to start at square one and just talk about the elements of a video production workflow, what's important, how we acquire footage, how we get to things, and then kind of move on to what does an on-prem remote hybrid workflow start to look like? What are the elements that are requisite there? Um, then I'm gonna get to tell you a little bit about SNS and how we solve a lot of these problems that we've come across in the industry uh, with our products. Uh, and kind of some unique pricing models and things that we do as well to try to be as customer friendly as possible. For those of you familiar with some of our competitors, you may not always love the price and support models. And we're gonna talk about how we address not just the technology, but also the budgets. At the end of that, we'll tell you a little bit, uh, show you some of our client stories, get to brag a little bit. And then we'll, if we have time, hopefully hop into a live demo where I get to show you this stuff kind of in action. Uh, how files may flow through, come back, uh, back and forth, and uh, be able to really keep things in sync and keep things moving in the workflow. So let's start off with elements of a video production workflow. So here we see the typical elements. These are ones I'm sure we're all very familiar with, sometimes painfully familiar with, um, whether that be encoding and capture over an SDI network, onto file-based workflows where we're just copying stuff over from a memory card, 
then obviously we have to store it. Ideally, I'm sure many of you know uh, the difference between online and nearline storage. We want storage that's fast enough for people to edit so that all those creative users out there aren't having to push and pull files up and down and working late uh, and all of that. Then we're gonna talk about media asset management, backup, archive. Now in the, I would say over the last five, 10 years, automation has become a big thing. How do we get these files moving without a, an assistant editor or producer physically taking a hard drive over to the playout system to get it scheduled? We're going to talk a little bit about delivery. How does that content get out um, to our ultimate viewers and consumers of the content that we create? And then obviously remote functionality. How do we keep all this going when people may not be allowed in the office? Or maybe now we can have flex time, like all those corporate people, where we don't have to be in the office till 10 o'clock at night just to get the show out. So while these are the core elements, obviously this isn't all. You've also got your B-roll, you know, maybe some drone footage came in, somebody rented an RE camera, and now we've got all that footage to deal with. Um, we've got switchers that need to be tied in. All of this stuff is converged. Historically, production and post were very separate. Now they're all kind of on that IT network. Not to mention the proliferation of uh, production applications. We're not just dealing in an avid Final Cut world anymore. We're dealing with Premiere, we're dealing with Resolve, we're dealing with animation and motion graphics, Blender, um, all over the place. And pretty quickly, our list of gear and, uh, and tools is longer than the show credits themselves. And then the biggest thing is often these systems are very disparate. As I said, traditionally post-production and production were different. As someone who has a bit of an edit background myself, the worst words in my world were always, we'll fix it in post because I would be upset with the production guys. We're like, why don't, why don't you frame your shot right? <laughs> like, well, we're running after this thing. So what we, what we really try to do is combine all of these things and how do we get these systems to talk to each other to create one seamless, smooth workflow where everyone's using the same tools, where the post-production person can go help with logging on the production side and get things out to the playout operator with the appropriate notes and tags and timings. How does that all happen? And so that's where on-prem, remote, and hybrid multi-site production workflows can really earn their metal. We're not moving files around. We're not FedExing drives. No one's managing physical logistics anymore. We can do this digitally. We can do it on a network. And so we'll start off kind of with the on-prem. I'm sure this is something we're most familiar with in our studios and in our facilities where talent may be shot on a soundstage, footage acquired, handed to post-production, which is on that other side of the wall. And this is where we have the most control, right? This is where we're able to build out the network we want. So when you have an on-prem shared storage server, it really should be the hub of the workflow. That's where all those assets are gonna live, certainly while they're being worked on, but also maybe into a nearline disk space tier for easy recollection later, uh, or off to an archive tier, which historically has been LTO tape for our industry, right? We don't wanna compress video because you can't uncompress it. Um, so then we have this big on-prem tape library uh, going on doesn't really help us so much with DR, but every piece of your program has to go through some tier of storage and then multiple tiers of storage throughout its life. So what we need is a product that not only you can trust, that's stable, it's not going to be down when we need it, and ideally a support team that actually knows what, what we're talking about when we say, hey, I got a problem with ProRes and Adobe Premiere, not someone who's going to tell me, hey, did you reboot it? But so we need servers that are built for media production. There are many out there. But what we really think that means is it has to be able to handle these higher resolutions as they come in, 4K, 6K, 8K. They need to be ready for whatever resolution is gonna come in the future. You accomplish that through having a scalable um, file system and server system that scales both for capacity and speed. So whether the challenge becomes with our network that we've added more people, thus requiring more throughput, or the challenge is, well, Someone went out and got a 16K camera and we want to take that into Premiere Native without transcoding it into an offline workflow, the network better keep up with that too. Because if you get the right producer, they're always right. Um, we just have to make it work. And then ideally, not charging a crazy license fee for every connection. I'm sure many of you have found that. How many people want to connect? Well, that's going to be this much. Um, some people charge per connection. Some people charge per terabyte if you're licensing a file system onto some other hardware, which means not only do your resources grow as your facility grows, but so do your costs. 
And that can be challenging to kind of get ahead. We don't want to be in that old, we lose two cents on every unit, but we make it up on volume kind of model. So now let's talk a little bit more about the off-prem aspect of this. Off-prem historically has meant disaster recovery. In a pre-pandemic world, off-prem was I got that tape, if the building burns down, we're okay. I sent a drive off to Iron Mountain. But our needs don't change. We still need speed. We need people to be able to edit. We ideally like to have that file system still connected so we're not breaking a bunch of media links. But what it really adds here when we try to get off-prem is that remote access. How do we connect to that media that's on-prem or in a cloud? And so with remote access to our on-prem shared storage server, your workflows can happen on-site or off-site. We just need to connect. We need to get physically linked there so we can see the files. So that way we can have some editors in the studio. We can have others at home and still others elsewhere. We can hire people in Britain or India or wherever the sun happens to be up so that we don't all have to work till two in the morning as we have, I'm sure, so many times. Um, and we all wanna be able to work on that same media at the same time without having to redundantly copy it all over the place and manage version control nightmares of who had the most recent version of that clip? Did that get updated? Is it updated everywhere? Um, one way to certainly do this and one that was adopted early on in the pandemic was let's just move everything to the cloud. When there's one copy, everyone can naturally connect. It's just the internet. Um, and while that does can work very well, the hybrid approach allows you a little more control over your budget and costs. So we really need to look at what the cloud is best for and the case for cloud storage, can it replace an on-prem media server? There's a few issues you're gonna run into if you try to go all cloud. One is obviously a latency issue, simply a speed over distance. Video has a unique need to play in real time. So when I scrub that playhead as an editor, it is not acceptable for me to wait to get to that frame, especially when I'm trying to narrow in on a specific frame. So that latency can cause me a problem. There is a way to solve that with the cloud. And that's essentially to virtualize the entire environment. So the media is in the cloud, but thus the workstation has to be in the cloud, physically proximate to that media in the same data center to eliminate that latency. And then I'm effectively remote desktoping into a cloud instance of a workstation. This can be incredibly expensive. So here I pulled some stuff from just, you know, public S Amazon's price calculator and Microsoft Azure's price calculator. It's all from public records here. We really wanted to take into account egress and ingress fees. So clouds don't just charge you to store your data. They charge you to move it. They charge you to move it up there. They charge you to take it out. Um, and then they start to charge you for the workstations next to that as well. So we just took a, what I would consider a mid-tier kind of environment. We got 200 terabytes of storage of footage that we need access to over time. So active kind of storage in that regard. Um, and it's gonna cost us per year about 56 grand in Amazon S3 to keep all of that online in the active tier of Amazon storage. And then I've got to add the workstation. So I got to add an EC2 instance. I didn't go crazy on the edit machines here. These aren't not, you know, off the wall color grading machines. This is a, I believe it was an eight core, 16 gigs of RAM competent editing machine in the cloud. That's 500 bucks per workstation per month. So now to that 56 grand a year for storing stuff, we're gonna add another 31 grand per five users. And very quickly, I'm spending almost $100,000 a year to be able to produce content. Something that when I'm in facility and I have my laptop and I have an on-prem server, I may have spent $100,000 on 200 terabytes of storage, but I'm not paying for it in year two. The nice thing with cloud and certainly one of the advantages is always, oh, I can turn it off if I don't need it. I don't know a lot of broadcast production people that just don't need to be working certain days of the week. You have a daily show, you have a weekly show, you have a series of daily shows. We don't have the option to stop. The other thing that these cloud workstations do is they limit it per hour. And they base their pricing models on a 40 hour work week. I don't know about you, but I, when I was in production and post did not work 40 hour weeks. 40 hour weeks were a novel concept for my friends who had regular jobs. Um, so the cloud to be a complete replacement will require a significant investment and an ongoing investment that you can never get out from under. And that's where the hybrid model comes in. So hybrid can mean a lot of different things in different parts of the workflow. Um, 
you can use VPNs to establish remote connectivity, in which case I have really an on-prem workflow that I'm connecting to and maybe remote desktoping in through something like Teradici, which I'm sure you're familiar with, or uh, just controlling a workstation that's connected on-prem through a VPN. Then we have CDNs, content delivery networks. Those are often cloud hosted because those have to distribute and be played across numerous television sets across the globe. They need play out, they need all of these things. So we need to be able to interact with those certainly in order to get the content that we create out to our viewing audience who does ultimately pay the bills. Well, I guess the advertisers do, but it's easier to bill them when people actually watch. And then we talk about disaster recovery as well. And this is where the hybrid model really helps because the this is where the cloud has a huge advantage. If I don't need the footage, the cloud is inherently redundant. Amazon has data centers all over the globe. So does Microsoft, even lower tier storage only cloud providers like Wasabi and Backblaze. So that if my building burns down, the data is already there. I can get it back. And at that point, I'm not gonna worry about an egress fee because the insurance company is gonna pay for me to get my data anyway. And no one now has to manually manage, oh, I've got two copies of the tape. We have to get one tape offsite. We have to do this. Where is that one? All of that. So DR to me is really where the cloud for media production earns its keep. I do have clients who use the cloud to bounce data off of. That can be hybrid as well. I can upload to a cloud and have it automatically download on the other side, but then I'm hitting those egress fees. And very quickly, my accounting department goes, well, what did we spend 20 grand this month on? Uh, sorry. So it's important to understand those costs. And right now, cloud service costs are still quite opaque. A lot of the services you'll see will charge you 25, 50 bucks a month per user, but then they don't account for render credits and egress and moving the data around. And then all of a sudden, clients get bills much larger, larger than they expect. Which is going to bring us to the next key element. Data now lives across all these places. And that's what Marty was alluding to earlier here, media management. Now these files may live redundantly. They may live in multiple locations. They may just be in backup. They may be offline. How do I find them? How do I make sure that's the one that I want? And that's really what media management is all about. Now, for those of you who have worked with asset management systems in the past, you know they can be quite complex. And this is where SNS differs from a traditional media management software. We believe that things need to be very easy to use. This is how you drive adoption. You cannot stop a creative user from getting into your server and getting into the file system. If the media management software has access, so does the user. Um, and so if they start doing what they naturally know, a new employee, they don't know the media management software, but they certainly know how to use the Mac Finder or the Windows Explorer, they can break all the work you've done in the media management software. It's dependent on its control of that file system. Obviously, managing assets is critical not only for large projects, but episodic, any high volume broadcast shows, especially daily news, where we have so much content coming in from so many places, getting it organized and being able to find it is critical. So from here, what I'd like to do is tell you, we've kind of talked about the problems, we've talked about the challenges. Um, next, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SNS. Uh, as a company, and then how we would use our tools and how our customers use our tools to really understand um, and solve the challenges that we've described. I will say too, on the MAM front before we move on, that MAMs often charge per user as well and per concurrent access. So I potentially have a storage that charges me per person to connect to it. And then I have a software that charges me per person to search it. And again, my costs balloon quickly. And I don't know about you guys, but in my experience, budgets have been declining in our industry over the last few years. So as we get asked to do more with less, it's very hard to maintain these legacy large pricing models. I still haven't figured out exactly when searching my own file cabinet became an operating expense, but apparently that is a thing. So as we move forward, I'll tell you a little bit about SNS and where we come from. Uh, kind of this will help to define the way that we think about our products and view our relationship with our customers. It is a fairly unique story. So all the way back in 1997, uh, SNS was not SNS. We were a small uh, multi-room production facility, multi-million dollar production facility, but a production facility nonetheless. Um, and we bought some shared storage. At the time it was to help with a, 
an audio workflow. Fun fact, Pro Tools didn't work with shared storage in 1997, something we learned a very difficult way. So we had to fix it. And in fixing it, discovered that we had created something unique, something that hadn't been done before. So we took that out to a, to a trade show to show people and tell them and say, look, this is kind of neat. Technicolor took notice, flew out to St. Louis to see the facility, to see what we had built, and promptly wrote us a check on the spot. Technicolor was our first client. So while we fixed this problem in 97, the company was born in 1998. And ever since then, all we do is make shared storage for video and audio production. And back then, it was more than enough simply to be able to stream high resolution media and thousands of audio files simultaneously from the same server. As the industry's needs have changed, we continue to develop. And because of the challenges we had in the beginning with the storage that we had purchased, we believe wholeheartedly in building everything that we sell. We don't OEM third-party products into our, soft, into our hardware or software. Um, we develop our own um, versions of our OS, drivers for components, um, so that we are the absolute last word if there is any problem with our system, that our support team can be as knowledgeable as anyone, that we don't have to wait for anyone else. We do also provide our own custom professional services. If you do have an older asset management system that is draining the budget every year, we can help migrate you to ours um, for a nominal fee. We also believe in having real world testing environments. With video, when it comes to streaming video and video assets, the only way to be sure is to do it. So we maintain a state-of-the-art uh, multi-workstation uh, testing bed where we actually set up our servers, fill them up, and play video and audio from them until they break so that we know exactly where the lines are. And so what we do make here, as I keep alluding to our, our kind of philosophy, what we make is something called the Evo Shared Storage Solution. But as we saw earlier, a shared storage solution needs to be much more than just a place to park files. That's all right for a backup server, but it's not all right for the hub of your workflow. And with that in mind, we've continually developed software to go along with our hardware to be sure that we can provide both the performance as well as the workflow needs for our clients. So Evo itself is actually the shared storage hardware. It comes in a variety of shapes and sizes that we'll review here in a little bit. Share Browser is our media asset management system. It is free in unlimited fashion with whichever Evo someone buys. Whether you buy our smallest little box to help manage and just get the asset management uh, to manage some other storage that's legacy and already there, or whether it's all our own stuff, Share Browser will help you index, tag, search, um, and manage those assets across not only our storage, but any existing, any cloud system you'd like to hook into, as well as LTO tape or any other tier. As I said, media ma management has to be robust. We have Slingshot, which I'm proud to tell you guys is a complete RESTful API. It's a JSON-based API, also something we do not charge for. So for those of you familiar with Python uh, scripting and JSON, you can create all sorts of custom automations at no additional charge for yourself. I alluded to the professional services a minute ago. We can also develop custom hooks and workflows to integrate different pieces of the workflow for you. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Nomad, which is a remote workflow utility we built to accommodate offline online workflows uh, over a wide area network, over the VPN, uh, to be able to accomplish that remote access piece that became so prevalent uh, a couple of years ago, and sadly remains with us today. In short, Evo is a workflow solution. So I will say over 23 years, I guess we've done something right because we've gone from our first Technicolor up in Montreal to now Evo in over 70 different countries and working with some of the largest brands um, and content creators in the world, including Netflix, Disney, the ones that we all know. But what's been so exciting to me is to see our servers and video content creation grow into departments and into non-traditional places. So while we all know what Viacom CBS is and we all know HBO, Harvard Business School has an EVA to accommodate remote learning um, for, their, for their instructors to be able to weather the pandemic, to be able to bring more education even to non-students um, and extend video off. So 
the content creation has grown so far beyond what it was now that we all have a 4K camera in our pocket at all times. Um, as we were speaking about YouTube earlier, uh, YouTube itself is a client, YouTube Studios. Uh, so it's just really neat to see where video has gone. Uh, for those of you who eagerly anticipate uh, some large events from a large San Francisco based hardware manufacturer that we may all like to work with, uh, a lot of those are done on Evo. A lot of the, the talks and things like that. So let's take a look at the hardware first because it all starts with the hardware. Any software is only as good as the hardware that it runs on. We rate the storage in streams of video. This is always your first indication for someone who understands video. Because again, as I said, the only way to really test what you're gonna get is to do it uh, in real world. When we compare ourselves um, to the competition that's out there based on their publicly available published stream count charts, you'll notice we don't rate the Evo in megabytes or gigabytes per second. We are up to 84% faster and on average about 60% faster than the rest of the field. Evo is the fastest single node high performance NAS for video streaming that we have come across. And we are constantly looking. As we said earlier, this needs to be scalable. Our workflows change. Resolutions get larger. Producers come in, feature films pop up, documentaries pop up. So it's important to be able to accommodate that. To do that with, for instance, the high resolution image sequences, we would turn to SSDs. One thing you won't see within Evo is a caching layer. In my experience, and it's kind of as Marty said at the beginning here too, um, no creative team has ever come to me and said, Steve, you know, we just have too much storage. And the same can be true of a cache. If we start with a cache built for two or three editors to handle a DPX or an EXR sequence or to prep out IMFs uh, for content delivery, we can quickly overflow that cache and the cache isn't as scalable as the system. So we choose to build the system out of the fastest drive that it will need so that we can never accidentally overflow giving our users an improper experience to which they blame their engineering team. To do this, we also support 10, 25 and 50 gig ethernet. And we use a custom Linux operating system that we have developed in house. Now we do use advanced caching algorithms within RAM to move data quickly between the disks and the RAM for random access and quick access so that when someone loads up a project for the first time, it happens as quickly as possible. We also use these algorithms to tune standard network protocols. So when we talk about our stream counts here, we're talking about doing this over SMB or AFP or NFS. I know AFP is deprecated, but there are still users out there doing it. Um, and this also maximizes that interoperability. Because the other thing you get with a lot of people who do have proprietary connections to their system, uh, where you have to charge, be charged for a user that's gonna connect, you also have a proprietary file system that talks to itself, but doesn't talk to all those other things on the network. And so then we have to have extra software and middleware to get things in between. At the highest level for an IT engineer, we can say we're a Linux-based server, presenting over SMB on your network. That is about the maximum in interoperability you can get. As you can see here, these are some common bit rates, uh, common codecs that we see out in the world. We do have a more comprehensive list internally. And what we would see here is that ProRes 422HQ, <clears throat> 720 megabits per second. This is 16 HDDs putting out 17 streams of 422HQ or 12 streams of uncompressed four by four at 24 frames a second for feature film work. That's your AE, your editor, your producer, all playing full resolution video in a multi-cam sequence back in real time out of just a three RU box. Now, this has been a big thing. This has been one of the biggest changes in my opinion over the last two, three years. Everyone remember those fun days when all we had to do to be secure was to air gap our our server, it's all right, it's over there. No one else can touch it. It's not connected to the internet. Well, then people needed to work remotely and no longer was it an option to air gap a server. So we do take security very seriously. 
We have for a very long time, and we accomplish this in some standard ways. We accomplish security in some standard ways and in some very non-standard ways, more unique to the needs of a video production team. We do this through unique permission modes. Some of those include, well, I'm sure everyone's familiar with read, write, read only, no access, right? Your SIFs, your ACLs, and your permission levels. Evo adds to that read, write, reject, delete. This allows us to safely collaborate without having to lock people down. More important, um, it helps to mitigate the risk of ransomware. The way a ransomware attack would work would be to infect the file system, and then that malicious code would start writing new files. It would duplicate the file in an encrypted form and delete the original unencrypted version until you get a fun note from someone with an interesting accent telling you how much money it's gonna cost for you to go back onto the air. By using the read, write, reject, delete permission, the malicious code would not be able, would not have permission to delete because SSH is disabled. The user permissions table is handled in the OS drive of the server with no root access. There is no transversion between the file system that holds the files and where the file permissions live. Evo can also be bound to Active Directory for central permissions management. In addition, Evo can support both AD users and local users so that if your domain controller were to become infected, you would still be able to access your files through the local user you set up. So that's a little bit about how you can handle external risks. Now let's talk about internal risks. On the upshot, internal risks usually aren't malicious. They're naive <laughs> or sloppy. And while certainly a read-only or read-write reject will delete permission can help with that, it also is helpful to be able to audit user logs to see how our people access things and to send those off to syslog. So we did release user log and we can track all the actions and interactions of every user on the Evo server. So that would include how, who accessed the file, when did they access it, did they download it, did they rename it, change its location so they broke a media link so we can find it. It also includes our network recycle bin. Some applications, um, certainly Media Composer being one of them, needs to be able to delete files. So read, write, reject, delete would no longer be appropriate there. It has to be able to delete a bin lock file. Um, with the network recycle bin, if a user, or again, a malicious piece of code starts deleting files, they are not actually deleted from the server. They go to the net network recycle bin. They're held for a user defined period of time before they're permanently deleted, and we can always restore them. So whether we're fighting ransomware or an overzealous intern trying to clean up our file system, the network recycle bin is there to undo the problem. The next uh, thing we worry about always is compliance. There are many different compliance organizations within our industry, certainly the MPAA, SMPTE itself, um, for different standards and the standards that you guys set. Uh, and there's a few that we really work hard to, to conform to. First and foremost, Evo holds the TAA stamp, which means made in America. This is critical for our government clients to know that this software and the system is developed here in the United States and provides a certain level of security in that. Um, any foreign actor, or no crazy backdoors or anything like that. Additionally, our server sits in facilities that are, have passed both MPAA accreditation as well as TPN. Uh, on that side, so the newer trusted partner network. Possibly on a higher standard, um, certainly a more public facing one, uh, or maybe a less public facing one, is the FIPS standard, the Federal Information Processing Standard set out by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Uh, this is required for highly secure environments as part of government organizations. So DOD, uh, think NSA, all those agencies that may or may not actually exist, um, as well as major top secret uh, government contractors, maybe making planes or missiles or radar systems, whatever, um, or simply observing our universe. Um, we do conform to FIPS as well, and NASA, NIST, and the DOD actually all use EVA to manage their content. Now, from the remote access perspective, we do need to find a way to securely um, expose 
the data to external users. And with that in mind, SNS has developed its own VPN client specifically for the server itself. This is a secure VPN client. As I said earlier, SSH is disabled, but this is one we had to kind of build in house and it provides dedicated access to the device within the network. More on that in a little bit. So as we move on here, uh, this is the product lineup right here. So as you can see, Evo can be as small as a little one RU person or as much as a multi-node 16 bay with hundreds of rack units and multiple petabytes of storage. Um, everything you see on the screen here in front of you does come with all of the software that I've described in a limited fashion. And with that said, let's get on to looking at that software. Because hardware is fun. Whoa, that chair got exciting. Um, let's take a look at the software tools because this is really the glue of the workflow. So as I said earlier, included for free in every Evo is the share browser, asset management system, slingshot, API, and automation user interface. So while I'm well aware that I'm sitting here with a bunch of engineers, I can assure you that I can't write a script or code to save my life. So that UI to set up automation saves me a lot of time. I do click buttons as well as anybody. And then obviously the Nomad remote desktop utility. So let's start with the media asset management. Here we have share browser. Share browser comes in a variety of different interfaces itself. First and foremost, it is powerful and easy to use. And what I mean by that is it changes the idea of a man. Uh, right now, I'll tell you, I can see Marty and uh, a few people. Can someone just not, anyone worked with a man before? Anyone worked with an asset management? Can someone kind of give me a nod here? Yes, no, anyone on video? All right, I'm not getting much. I'm going to say maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But again, the way a MAM works is it is a database software. So normally what I do is I ingest footage into that MAM and the MAM puts files into the file system on the server, on the hardware where it wants to. Not in a way that makes sense to me as a user. That means if I do go into that Finder and Explorer window, I don't know. I don't know why those files are there that way. No one organizes their files like that. If I'm an independent user, freelancer, uh, whatever, I know how to make a folder and I make a project folder and a media folder and audio files folder and a renders folder. Um, and I organize my stuff that way. And that's what Share Browser does. Share Browser gives us direct file system access. I can see those folders. If I open something in the Finder, I open in the Share Browser, it looks the same. So it doesn't matter where I work. I can't break the Share Browser by using the Finder or the Explorer. Now what Share Browser adds obviously is the ability to tag those files, create custom metadata fields that are shared. I can create a custom metadata tag in Mac OS, won't do you any good in Windows, won't even do you good on the Mac next door to me in the suite one over. So Share Browser provides that shared database. As I said, we can index into our database any other storage on the network. So whether that be cloud, LTO tape, so it gives me that central place to look. We can even hook into AI systems for auto tagging and transcription. We can create collections. This is that kind of traditional man thing, what we call bins, where I can take files that live in disparate locations, but I can put them into one view. And we'll see that a little later as well. The next thing we need from a man is it has to be integrated. I'm sure you've all worked with editors. They don't like leaving their edit applications, myself included. I don't wanna learn any other software. I know how to use Premiere. I know how to use Avid. I wanna use that. I know how to use Resolve. And with that in mind, we've provided share browser workflows for every major production application that's out there. We take a lot of pride in this. This is not an easy thing to do. And so if you're inside of Adobe Premiere or After Effects, there's a share browser extension. There's a panel you can open up and you can search your files and your bins. And what's really cool about that, especially for anyone who's ever edited in Premiere is rather than having to navigate to two different folders or shares or tiers of storage, I can grab everything in one view and just drag it right into my project. The metadata from Share Browser will come as an XML exchange. That same panel exists for Final Cut. Now, Final Cut doesn't handle its tags the same way. So when the Share Browser metadata goes into Final Cut, it becomes a keyword collection. And it becomes notes in the inspector panel. When it goes into Resolve, it goes under Shot and Scene metadata. And the idea here being you have homogenous metadata across your production application. But once you've linked to that media and you've entered that app, you no longer have to do know anything else than that application. Nothing is different to you. In the case of Avid Media Composer, we can mount as the Avid file system, giving you project and bin locking. An Avid editor doesn't have any idea if they're connected to Avid's own branded storage 
or to an SNS EVA when they're in the application. So that keeps our learning curve short. I don't have to check something in or check it out. I don't have to worry about recreating a folder structure. Point and click. Additionally, obviously we need to be able to search cloud storage and automate files to and from. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. And to be able to integrate with other tech in your facility. This is part, this is something that's very exciting for me as well. I don't think we have a full slide on it before we get into automations. SNS does also make storage for new tech. For those of you familiar with the TriCaster switcher or the LightWave software. And we have custom integration integrations using NDI through our new tech storage. So a new tech branded uh, new tech remote storage can actually see every NDI source on your network and encode up to 55 streams of HD 30, 15 streams of 4K 60 simultaneously without touching the processors of the switcher itself, massively expanding my ISO recording options. We also make storage for ROS video and interact with their expression on air graphics system, streamline newsroom automation system. Um, mirror replay, TRIA play out, to be able to move files into or out of or have them play directly off of our server. So we do take the integration side of things very seriously and try to partner with best in breed across the industry um, to be able to make things seamless um, for not only our end users, but also the engineers supporting them. And that brings us into some of this automation. Um, as we said in the elements of our workflow, getting things out to a CDN, out to a cloud service, is either a manual process, somebody's job to do that, an archivist, um, whatever. With file automation, nothing ever gets missed. And that's what Slingshot is all about. But there's also the ingest part of automation. I may have a disparate set of codecs that we've shot on that need to be transcoded to a more standard codec for the edit team. Slingshot handles all of this. So whether it's simply backing up files, syncing them across multiple sites over a VPN, um, or doing it on a schedule so that we make sure we're only using the network at off hours. Slingshot is there through its user interface to do all of this. And then more advanced scripting again through the actual API. We can send files to FTP, SMB, cloud storage. Um, and again, you can build more custom things on top. We actually support Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure. For those of you maybe in more boutique facilities or have friends who are working in more boutique facilities, it can be as simple as Dropbox. If someone puts something in Dropbox, Evo's gonna grab it, bring it down and alert the post supervisor that there's new footage. Could be Google Cloud, Wasabi, Backblaze. We can transcode that, we can transcode in an Apple blessed way, Apple certified ProRes. So I can bring all that footage in, I can flip it to a non interframe codec because well, editors don't love interframe codecs. I can have it all ready to edit within a very short period of time. This is what we mean when we talk about auto automation um, and integration. There's no third party thing to buy. This comes with the box. And, oh, but then you need that plugin. No, that's not how we do things. Now we get to talk a little bit about Nomad. So we talked about remote access. Let's get this stuff connected. What Nomad does, and I'll get, I'm really excited to get to show this to you, especially in an Adobe workflow, is that it takes these proxies because the, the man has to have a proxy so that you can look at it in the web. So when we index these files, we generate these proxies, they're all just sitting there. Now, because we can connect to the storage, what Nomad does is it takes those proxies out of the database. It downloads it to the remote editor's computer, whether that be because it's linked in a project file or it's in one of our catalog bin structures or simply a folder or a share. It downloads them, it renames them, and it makes them path-based. It matches the path of the original source file. So no longer do I have to relink media file by file, I can relink at a root folder level, and I never have to relink to conform. I'm just establishing an offline workflow for whatever application supports it. This is something certainly uh, many editors, especially many editors who have been around for a while are very familiar with the offline online workflow was incredibly pre prevalent when networks weren't quite fast enough to keep up even with HD. This does work on both Mac and Windows. So as a reminder, all of this stuff comes with Evo. We get more streams out of the same number of disks than any of our competitors, and certainly more than any standard IT server would. We've also optimized integrations for specific creative applications that are most prevalent. Now we get to talk a little bit about how do you connect. I'm sure many of you maybe were familiar with VPN before the pandemic. 
Um, if you weren't, I'm sure you became a lot more familiar with it. Um, VPN used to be the, the purview of someone trying to sneak and watch an NFL out of market game or simply create a proxy server to make your you know, phone number <laughs> look like a different area code. VPN is now essential to so many clients, whether that be a remote desktop workflow through Teradici or HPC Central, or whether that be simply to connect to an Evo. What we found was a lot of our clients did not have either the technical expertise or they were an organization so large that getting the request approved for VPN access was challenging. So we developed our own VPN service. Well, this maintains our no per seat license fee. This is one thing that is hosted in the cloud. No data is sent to the cloud through the VPN. It is only there for connectivity. And what this does for me normally, as I'm sure you guys are aware, if you VPN into my network here at home, if I were to give you VPN access and you were to use a VPN client, you would see my network. You would see my computer. You would see my wife's computer. You would see my printer, probably several iOS devices that are floating around in here. Um, I may not want that. And I can certainly manage those permissions at a switch level um, as an engineer and through Active Directory credentials and in a very complex way. SNS VPN does this physically. It provides connection to its own VPN client that, as I told you earlier, is already installed on the server. So that if I grant you access to the SNS VPN, I grant you access to a device within my network. I don't have to do any separate permissions management. And <clears throat> Well, the Evo itself can act as a virtual switch. It cannot pass that VPN connection through. You're not creating an accidental backdoor. And in many cases, we use the same open ports on your firewall that your existing VPN is already using. This is something that can be set up in less than 60 minutes. This is not something we manage. You buy it, we set it up for you, we hand you the keys to manage it. And this is also a month to month contract. So if the lockdown ends and everyone's coming back to the office, turn it off. You're not out for a year. It's only $350 a month for 10 terabytes of data transfer. And we only charge you 15 bucks a terabyte if you go over. So it's not crazy expensive. It's not $50,000 a year, the way storing all that stuff in the cloud would be. But it is a way that you can quickly enable and build your own cloud uh, with your already expensive on-prem equipment. So here I get to brag a little bit. I'm gonna tell you about how some of our users uh, use our tools and products. Uh, if you, we have a very large, obviously over 23 years of doing this, we've collected quite a few clients and being in 70 countries, um, we're going to share you some stories with you, but feel free to go to our website, snsevo.com and check out the user story section. If you guys want to find more, it's really neat. It's organized with a bunch of tags. So if you want to find uh, Adobe specific uh, clients or Final Cut or Avid or Pro Tools, you can just click on those little tags uh, and they'll bring up the stories specifically to that. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to start off with a feature film. So we have a production company called Scooby Scubalon, who in 2020 released The Cleansing Hour, which is one of the top releases on Shutter, which is a streaming service for uh, those of you Fangoria or horror fans out there. It was great. And what was cool about this for me from the workflow perspective is this is something I don't come across very often. This production, this feature film uh, had to use every NLE. So they had Nuke for compositing as well as AE. They had Resolve, they had Premiere, they had Avid. Um, you don't usually, there was even some Final Cut in there. So you don't usually see all of them used. You see one or two. So it was really neat to see our tools be able to translate that metadata and provide collaborative ability between all of these different applications. Next we have Borderless Film. So this is actually a production company out of Korea um, who does YouTube original series. They have K-pop evolution on YouTube. Uh, they've done feature films. Uh, they have TV programs. They have episodic TV. And what was neat about this one that I thought was really striking was that the founder of the company, the producer, um, had no IT staff. He had an edit staff and a creative staff. He was able to set everything up himself without any help from IT, a little bit of help from our support team, and then not only set up a shared storage server, but set up an automated workflow with no help. Um, just through exploring our knowledge base articles, some of our how-to videos on the website under the watch, and he was able to build a workflow that delivered the cloud and all over the place. Um, so this is something that keeps it very simple um, and speaks to the stability of the system. This one's just cool. Hammerhead Entertainment. Uh, this is Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s production company, and this is just about volume. I'm a sucker for anything Aerie Alexa. Um, this is all Aerie raw footage. 
uh, being used as well as 8K uh, red weapons and coming from a storage that was a push-pull workflow, wasn't fast enough. And Evo was able to come in and not only provide the speed for all these editors to use the same clip and not st and stop wasting time uploading and downloading and copying and who has this copy and who has that, but also to be able to organize what turned out to be quite a bit of content that had just been sitting on drives on shelves or central storage servers in redundant ways. Um, next one, I'm sure you guys all know. I think we've all probably heard of Microsoft. Um, this one was cool because it gets to use that NDI workflow. Microsoft first bought an Evo um, for their post-production uh, in the Channel 9 studio. Then they hooked a TriCaster up to it to use the NDI functionality. And now they can record directly to the shared storage. So I don't have to pull a drive from a switcher or out of a capture device to move files over to the server. They record right where they're supposed to be. Post picks up often in real time using growing file. So they can actually watch a file grow on their timeline in post while a live production is still going on. More important, the volume here is what's impressive. They're doing over 100 videos a week, all Microsoft training, internal training, external training, uh, things like that. And it's really cool campus. Um, so it's just a neat place to be able to be. This next one I'm gonna show you is a company called Digital TV. And I'm actually gonna show you two quotes um, from a couple of different employees here. This is interesting. I'm sure you guys all scrambled during the pandemic as I did. Um, well, these guys at uh, Digital TV were able to launch a network in six months during the pandemic. So imagine how much we were scrambling. They went from nothing to a broadcast network and video on demand service in six months. Um, so they're a digital tree on here. And what's so cool about this is the, the first quote back here is from the technical manager, right? And this is the highest praise I can get from a technical manager. I don't have any problems. I don't have to worry about it. I can sleep at night. No one yells at me. But I love this one too on the IT officer because we really like when customers use tools in ways we didn't necessarily design them to be used, but it fills a need and the client identifies that. And so from Chris here, the IT officer, they actually started using Slingshot and the transcoding to populate their video on demand library. So they had a multi-step automation that transcoded it, delivered it to their VOD playout system. And it was just neat to see. We had never thought to do that, but he did because he had the tool in front of him. And so as a reminder, you have Evo, which is our hardware platform, Share Browser, our media asset management software, Slingshot, the automation builder, and Nomad the remote editing utility. And all of that can be tied together with an SNS branded VPN or just with your own VPN. Uh, if you wanna manage the permissions that way, you already have one uh, in set up and ready to go. If any of you would like to get something like this a little more tailored, we are gonna jump into a live demo here in a little bit. But if you to something more tailored for your environment and to know how many disks you need for speed or how to repurpose what you've got and how to get our tools in house, feel free to hit us up uh, at snsevo.com. There's a little, uh, actually it's a rather large yellow button there in the upper right. It says how to buy. You just fill out your contact info. Sadly, for many of you, I often get to handle some of the workflow discussions uh, for our North American clients. So you may have to listen to me yet again, um, talk about your workflow and help design it for you. Uh, but we can certainly make a custom tailored uh, demo as well and kind of take you on a tour of how the software works. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to me during the presentation. I'd like to open the floor up for any questions. Well, let's do that for five or six, 10 minutes. And then I can hop into the live demo and show you how this stuff works. Um, and some of your questions we may answer with, eh, let's check out the live demo. Um, it might even kick us off into it. So thank you guys so much. And uh, like, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Do we have any questions? I might ask you just a basic question about, um, say, hardware failure. If um, a drive or two goes, um, how is that redundancy handled, and, and how would that impact um, users? It's a great question. Um, the drive fails within an Evo. Um, you will get many, many alerts. You'll get an SNMP alert. You'll probably get an email alert if you have that set up as well as a very, very annoying shrill alarm going off in your server room. The drives are all hot swappable. Uh, and this is where it's different. We don't use a global hot spare, Michael, like a lot of people do. I don't know if any of you guys ever had a RAID rebuild kickoff in the middle of an editor's day and everyone starts wondering why the network's slow. 
you have to explain to them why the server and network's protecting itself. So we don't do that. Um, if a drive were to die, you would hot swap it. You could schedule when that rebuild happens so you could get past the end of the day without affecting the editors on that side. And when you choose when to commit that drive. Uh, more important uh, in a lot of ways, I guess, is we do also provide spares kits with the system. So it's not something you have to wait for an overnight and something you can just kind of have at the ready on that side. And then also we burn our drives in. So first and foremost, I mean, full transparency, only two companies on earth make hard drives. No one's got a unique hard drive in their system. We use the Ultrastar drives, formerly Hitachi, uh, now Western Digital. So there's no Seagate in here. More important, we do burn them in for about a month and a half. We custom build every unit. So before it goes into the unit itself, we've eliminated all those early dead uh, DOAs. In our experience, we have found that drives typically die in the first month, month and a half, and then not again for many, many years. Um, so through our QA and QC process, we eliminate those early ones. We have a very, very low instance of drive failure. So we try to mitigate it that way as well. It's better if it just doesn't die, <laughs> Michael, but all drives will eventually. Steve, you commented on the, um, the latency issue between the cloud and the workstation. Could you explain that a little better to me and how you bring them into sync? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously, over distance, um, well, we can solve a lot of problems in this world. We can't solve physics. Uh, so if I need to, even if my internet were fast enough um, to handle, let's say, a 4K ProRes file at 720 megabits, so 90 megabytes a second. So let's say I've got a consistent 100 down. You've got a consistent 100 up no matter what happens, but you're 30 miles away from me. Well, when I go to move that playhead, right, I'm going to get some stutter. It's got to catch up uh, to do that. And the way we kind of keep that in sync is either to use Nomad, Marty, so that we're actually referencing a proxy or a source file locally, making that redundant copy to eliminate that latency. So we're eliminating the distance portion um, at that point. And we just keep the file structures in sync. So the media links to the source are always ready for export. Um, you, your local proxy could be an exact duplicate of the file if you want it to be, so you could render locally as well. Um, so that's how we would mitigate it uh, on that side. One thing you can't do is even if you have workstations in the cloud and someone has, is having a particularly bad internet day, um, you can't eliminate that latency even of the monitor signal. So the way other people would solve that, like with Terry Dici, for instance, or HPZ Central, you're not really streaming the media, right? You're streaming the monitor signal. So the latency, as long as it's consistent, is relatively okay. You move the timeline, you're actually controlling the computer and the workstation. I did have a, a very large uh, athletic client of ours. Uh, it was a major league baseball team who told me that they were using Z Central. Um, and they went to conform and, uh, well, wait a minute. You guys are the Northeastern chapter of Simd. Half of you may hate this baseball team. The other half may love it. I don't know. Um, but, uh, it depends where you are. But when they went in to render to the office to check everything, everything was shifted four frames. So even in that remote desktop, even with what felt like very low latency, we were off by four frames. Um, and that's what's not acceptable. So that's where that offline online. So we still have to send someone into QC. That's where having that offline file locally gives you that local feel and eliminates the distance. We're kind of, we're not fixing physics, we're adhering to it and faking it out. <laughs> uh, what, about, what, what about uh, error correction? Uh, as far as like just uh, forward error correction and things like that? Right, right. Again, we're not broadcasting out where you'd have to worry about that hiccup in the signal. This is primarily in the post environment. That would be something that's handled normally on a playout server or within the video network there um, through you know various methodologies that I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. This is about creating that content for us. And we would certainly deliver to a system that supports forward error correction um, and let it do its job or it could play off us because we're using that standard uh, the network protocol you know, over SMB. I would not say that Evo is here to replace your playout server. It doesn't have rundown software and things like that. It is here to make delivering files to that playout server more seamless and safer from the post team. Hi, Steve. Thanks for sure. doing this presentation. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of LAN and WAN uh, topology there is for some of the smaller uh, houses you work with? 
yeah um well when you're always let's see you guys are northeast so verizon mostly a lot of fios yeah in your world so sadly we're always bound by the isp on the WAN side i can't fix the internet uh believe me i wish i could uh but uh for land topologies more and more commonly what we're finding is 10 gig uh ethernet running over like cat 6a uh, cable which can go 100 meters so you don't have to do any special fiber optic runs or fiber termination um, get more advanced switches and in our more boutique um, environments let's say five six seven ten twelve even uh, users uh, evo can act as a virtual switch as a layer two switch so what we find quite often is people direct connect to the server to keep everything simple so we don't have to worry about vlaning a switch and routing and all of that and then Evo can actually pass the internet connection through. So one connection out to that house network, maybe to a standard gig E switch where maybe a producer is doing some review or something through the web app, looking at the low res proxy. They don't care about the high res, but the editors have their own dedicated 10 gig lines. Um, so the topologies most commonly I see, um, especially in smaller environments today are 10 gig copper. Um, some people are taking legacy fiber channel and converting it to ethernet. And all it takes to do that is really to change the NICs on both sides, the transceivers that it's speaking to. So if you have a legacy facility that's cabled up with OM3, you know, eight gig fiber channel, because you were connecting to an XSAN or something, you can just change out the HBAs and the workstations on the server, get rid of the fiber switch. And an Evo itself, like our servers can take up to 12 direct connect 10 gig ports in the back and act as a switch. They can take up to 26 one gig ports. Um, or 825 gig ports if you want to get real fancy in color grading. Um, or I believe 650 gig ports now is what it's up to. So it just depends what you want to do. Uh, I hope that answers the question for you. Yeah, it does. Um, that's just what I was wondering. And interesting that you have um, switch capabilities in the system itself. What NIC cards do you recommend to customers, particularly on the Mac side, because uh, slots are pretty much non-existence except on the very top of the line machines. Yeah. Um, on the Mac side, I would typically recommend the Addo card or the Addo adapter. Addo by far, in my opinion, and then a lot of our testing has the best Mac driver. Um, for a little more budget-friendly version, we've often used Sonnet um, and some of their Thunderbolt to Ethernet adapters. Uh, what it really comes down to, though, is you want to make sure that whatever adapter you use, and there's a few ways to accomplish that, right? You could do a a Thunderbolt to PCIe adapter, which I think gives you a little more flexibility. For clients who had a fiber channel card and a PCI, PCIe adapter, they are able to take that card out and put it in and add that PCI bus back to the Mac. Um, for those who have dedicated fiber channel adapters, you have to buy a whole new adapter, right? You can't service them uh, in the field. But in my experience, Addo and Sonnet are both competent. What you really want is it to have independent power. You don't want it to power over the USB-C or the ethernet. Um, connection uh because those tend to get in my experience too hot uh we i have i'll sadly admit this but i have let the smoke out of some of those adapters that were powered over ethernet trying to run a dpx sequence against it and uh sadly you can't put the smoke back into the electronics so that didn't work out well uh so i would just say anything that's going to have fans and an external power adapter um unless you're feeling like you, you just want to pull double duty and have a coffee warmer sitting there too. So that would be my recommendation. Okay. Well, one last question. One last question, if you, if sure. I could, when you were talking about working with TriCasters and using NDI, was that a source from disk kind of use? So using uh, transcoding to NDI as a source for switching? Could be, because uh, you could map an EVO volume as a DDR into the switcher. Um, New Tech has also written some macros to be able to take like our collection or our bin and move it to a local DDR. So in a multi-tricaster environment, what I was describing there, no, is that more that the NDI plugin in the new tech remote storage, which is the, the name of the product we make for new tech, um, can, is NDI aware. So it can see every NDI source on the network. In fact, one of the things that I've really had a lot of fun with it on is I'll run scan converter on the multi-viewer and see it as an NDI source. And I'll lay it as a multi-cam, like a, a reference track. So I can see all the ISOs in my edit. And if I disagree with the TD, I know where to go. Um, but no, it's actually seeing every source. So let's say we have a switcher, uh, whatever NDI enabled switcher, that's capable of four 
ISOs, right? So usually three in, three out in a program feed that I'm recording, right? Uh, but I have 10 cameras. Well, I can have all 10 of those cameras being recorded to the server, even though I'm not using them necessarily in the production to provide myself more latitude in post if I want to repackage something and use a different angle. So it actually does use the processors of the server to grab the NDI streams off the network and record them directly uh, to the shared storage, bypassing the switchers processors. And there is a macro inside of the TriCaster interface for those of you using TriCaster to initiate that record from the TriCaster as opposed to from the server. You can do it either way. We also have uh, users not using a switcher at all. Um, they're just using the, uh, the API and the NDI stuff. I have a 15 sweet veterinary school that just uses to turn cameras on in the operating theater so that they can record the operations uh, for education purposes. They don't need a switcher. They're not live streaming you know, the surgery on a cat or a dog or a cow or whatever the case may be. Um, but they do need to record it to be able to get it to post. And now rather than having to get a switcher to be able to record that or have to use a software that may or may not be valid on the next OS version, the server has that built in and it's fully NDI5 compatible as well. Thank you. So Steve, is that an option? Like, do you have to pay for that or is that included to be able to capture NDI like that? So Dennis, when you buy the new tech branded version of the server, it's included. Oh, I see. I see. Um, it's not an option with ours. So we do have clients who will buy like our nearline server or our online server and a smaller new tech piece that happens to come with storage because the new tech and the Ross piece for what it's worth come with all the other software that I talked about today and we're going to get to look at here. Um, they just have a couple of unique things to fit their mode um, and what their purpose is and to integrate with the other products for whom we make that storage, whether that be again, Ross Expression, Mirror Replay, or whether it be New Text MDI, um, doesn't matter. So sometimes you have to kind of stack them together. But again, you're always adding storage and processing power for automations. And as we said at the beginning, I've never met an editor or creative team member that's ever said, you know, gosh darn it, just too much storage. Thanks. Speaking of too much storage, how does your system scale uh, across multiple nodes? Um, are you able to grow the namespace or the file system? And, and does that provide any additional level of sort of node-based protection at that point? It does. Or not? So if you're looking for like a high availability structure, you can certainly do that across multiple nodes um, if you want to. Uh, it just depends how you want to do it. So yeah, you can have a single node. And this is kind of where we're unique too. Uh, relative to some others out there in the world, uh, we give you the option. So you can scale a single node with SAS connected expansion chassis uh, within that nodal structure. I call that scaling vertically. I always think of it as one rack, right? Um, and you can get up to 80 disks in a single node. So you can get quite a large namespace that way. Um, or you can buy additional server heads and scale what I call horizontally because I think of each node kind of as a rack in my head. Uh, and that would get me uh, that high availability if one server had were to fail, another one will pick up. There's a small blip to the editor, but everything from a business continuity standpoint is there. And you can start one way and move to another one. You can convert it. So it's very flexible uh, in that regard. Uh, and I think that's also something that's very important. Most of our competitors now will only allow you to continue to buy head units and scale in that clustered methodology, um, which again, is just more expensive. It's good for them. They make more money. But some clients just want an expansion chassis. They just need some more space and speed, and that's it. And so we try to give our clients the options to do both. Any other questions for Steve? Cool. Well, Steve, I want to thank you very let's much. It, well, real quick, let's do a little bit of the live thing here. Mark. I'm going to show you a couple of these interfaces. Great. Yeah, I'm going to show you a little Love bit of these uh, interfaces, and you guys can feel free to interrupt me during this part. Uh, real quick, we'll take a quick poll of the audience here. I can do this on a Mac or a PC. Works the same on both. What do you guys want to see? No one seems to care. Well, then I'm going to go with Mac to save you me hitting the command key to copy things and having the Windows start menu pop up a thousand times um, during the demo here. So if you leave it up to me, it's going to be Apple. All right, let me get this screen share going again.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. Let's go to. All right. You guys should all see the Mac desktop now. Here you can see a bunch of shares mounted. Um, and for those of you familiar with connecting to shared storage servers, you can obviously connect to server. You can see all your shares. You can get them on your desktop. But that's not why we're here. We're here to look at Share Browser. So Share Browser, again, media asset management thing. And this is where we flip that, uh, that idea of a MAM on its head. So normally, a MAM goes something like this. I have an airy bin. The files live in different locations in the file system. If I were to enter the file system, though, audio library share, which isn't mounted at the moment, so let's find static assets. Well, where's the area been? I'm a new guy. I don't know how this works. I need to find that clip. That's why we also have that volume view. So when I look at the media share here, and I look at the media share here, they match. More importantly, they interact. If I were to right click and create a new folder, let's create the simple folder. That helps to be able to type everybody. Go with simpty. Well, that folder shows up right there. It makes sense. It's congruent. That's where that ease of use comes in. Some other nice things we have in here. What's the, speaking of Avid from earlier? Is there are a lot of Avid workflows out there. And the mount is the Avid file system. And now when we look at that share, we get our info, you'll notice it's mounted as Avid FS. That would give Media Composer its project and bin locking. And that kind of collaborative offline, online workflow we're all so used to. More important, we index it. So anyone ever had to clear an Avid bin lock before in your life manually? You can search for the .lck file up here as we've indexed the share. I don't have any because I don't have it open. But I would be able to clear that. I wouldn't have to go crawl the file system. We can start to tag files. More important, again, these things have been indexed. So not only indexed, but proxy. Remember I told you the proxies are always there for a remote workflow? There's the proxy. I can watch the file. I can listen to the file. Super fun little beat here to generate a waveform. I can timestamp that file. I can add additional tags. I can also create for ourselves custom drop down fields that we might use uh, to be able to not give people the freedom to put whatever they want in the tag field, but to be able to select um, from a drop down. As I navigate around, these vol this volume is offline. Let's go ahead and grab a bunch of these files. And let's go over here and let's add Simpty. For those of you who have worked with MAMS before, I don't envy you the long, arduous meetings of figuring out what. MAM companies uh, like to call your metadata schema, which is basically your lexicon. What are you going to call stuff? Let's all agree on it. And we all agree on it. And six months from now, we don't agree anymore. And it's ridiculous. And changing things is challenging. So for us, rather than having to, to do this, we say just use the system. Notice that I've selected a folder here. And I'm going to use the bulk tag option over there. There's Simpty. Spell it right the first time, you'll never have to worry about it again. And bulk tag does exactly what you expect. It adds a tag to every subfolder, every file, all the way down. So again, I can do this stuff quickly and kind of churn and burn. Now going forward, if I want to find everything that's empty, click on it. I could also just put it up here. But when you go into this top bar, this is a global search. So not only does this search against our tags or comments or custom fields here, but also against all that file system metadata, that EXIF data from your camera, the frame rate, code I can use, whatever the case may be. More important, you can also distill those results. I can say, well, I want SIMPTY and another tag, or I want SIMPTY and I, well, it damn well better be 2997 if it's going to air. Show me all that stuff. There it is. And I'm going to grab these, and I'm just going to shift click, just like I would in my operating system. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to command click to select out of sequence. Then I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a bin. And we're going to create the Simpty bin. We're going to make that public. We're not going to move any files. We're not going to duplicate anything, but this is that kind of traditional man structure. Let's go to Simpty. All the files are still where they were. I haven't broken any old media links or duplicated anything. 
Let's go edit. I need to pop into Premiere. Okay, well, that's what happens when you unmount a volume you're using in a project. Don't do that. Um, we're going to clear this out real quick, and we're just going to start fresh. Let's go right over here. And we can choose. If I'm an editor, I know where my files are. I'm going to go by the volume. That's how I've always done it. If I'm a producer, I don't know where the files are. Someone's curated a bin for me and made selects. I'm going to come down and I'm going to find my Simpty bin. Oh, give it a second. I gotta catch up. Yeah. This is why you should also delete bins when you're done. I just do demos all day. When you delete a bin, you don't actually remove uh, the files or destroy the file. You just remove the structure. And so we're going to scroll down. And we're going to find Simpty right there. And here are all my files. I'm going to go ahead and move that so I get a little more screen real estate. I usually keep this for what it's worth on a second monitor. But in a demo, I only get to show you one monitor, so I keep it docked up here. Now, when I try to link to that source file, I got a problem. File's not there. But I know because it's gray. So again, kind of intuitive. I can right click here. and We'll just mount the volume from inside of our panel. We'll pop over here. We'll drag these files right into Premiere. So now I'm actually importing files from multiple locations. I don't have to command I multiple times or get to the media browser in different ways and do different things. Um, more important, we've done an XML exchange. All of our tags and comments are right here, naturally in the application. So now I can make Premiere look like it always does and I don't have to know anything else. Now, when we do this, Adobe files are not network aware. Uh, so After Effects Illustrator. And that really means on a server, you and I can open the same project file at the same time, but only one of us is going to get to save it. We're going to find out who tomorrow, which is less than an ideal time to find out you lost yesterday. So we're going to pop back over to the share browser. And we're actually going to look at where this file is stored. We're going to go to the project share and we're going to scroll down to where that project lives. And what we'll find when I open that project, or if I created that project, I get a green write lock. Evo actually locks files by their extension. For those of you familiar with Media Composer workflows, think of it as an avid bin lock. Difference is I can right click here and right where it says release lock, if that file were locked, I can request an unlock. It will send a pop-up message to the right user asking them to leave my file, or I can open it. I'll get it read only. And if I had to save, I'd be forced to save as, and I would simply comment as to why there are multiple files. So again, powerful, but easy and familiar. Well, we made that Simpty bin, but, and we certainly started to edit it, but maybe someone in the web needs to review it. It's important to know we do use VPN. As I said earlier, we do this for protection. VPN is more secure in our experience in SSL. Um, now this bin itself, when I navigate again, I could go bin or volume. But if I go to the bin and I just want you to review it, this creates a unique URL for me. So I can say, hey, Marty, take a look at this link uh, for me. Helps if I copy the right one. I'll pop over here. And Marty, you would be taken right to my collection of files. You could do that in thumbnail view. You could do it in list view. You could watch the file. You could timestamp the file uh, and say, eh, Steve, maybe we uh, maybe mark in here. Something like that. Well, now right back inside of Premiere, I come back over to my bin. That link is already right there. because We're sharing the database. So everything is seamless and quick. But now I may need to work remotely. So again, connected over that VPN, let's go ahead and go into Premiere. Well, let's do a save as as our project. I could just download this out of the share browser or again, out of the finder or the explorer. It doesn't matter which one I use here. Everything is familiar. I'm not gonna have to train you for a week on how to do this. In fact, we often joke, if you're considering hiring a new intern, put them in front of share browser and tell them to search. If they can't do it, maybe check the next person. Um, we're going to go ahead and drop this onto our desktop here, and we'll call it Simpty. 
uh, in honor of our hosts. And we'll hit save. Now we're going to minimize this. And we're going to use Nomad. And to get back to that security uh, part, and I'm just going to do this with Premiere, but we can do this with pretty much any application. Uh, pop in here. Notice I see my SIMPTY bin. So I could grab my bin. Now, in this case, I've already got a lot of this stuff linked into a project file. So what Nomad's really asking me for here is an input and an output. And I'm going to use the Premiere project as my input because this is already started. I'm not starting it from home. If I did start from home, I would use my panel to link to it, or maybe I would just grab the bin in preparation. But now I need a local folder. And Marty, this goes back to how am I going to eliminate that latency? Right. So while my project linked through the panel is connected to my files on the server over the VPN, I have that latency issue. I am not next to the server. Um, so we're going to create the SIMPTY Northeast work from home folder. And we're going to drag that in as my output. And now Nomad's going to parse that project. That's going to say, okay, this, these are the files. These are the clips you need. These are having to be MP4s and moves. We're just going to copy those down. And what we're going to find is it tells me the method is proxy. It's pulling those proxies from our database. More important, it's recreating the file folder path of our server. So rather than having to relink these files individually inside of Premiere, I can right click, attach proxy, navigate simply to the root, because Adobe is clever enough to find all the other proxies as long as they download in the same relative path. Come over here to my desktop, attach, and then just toggle proxy. Now I'm referencing that file locally on my machine. And quite frankly, the other thing here that's nice versus the all cloud solution is these files are local. Might, well, you guys might be in for a nor'easter here sooner than later from what I'm hearing. My power can go out. The internet can go away. I can be buried under eight feet of snow and I can be editing because I have the asset. Now I'm gonna need to reconnect to export and render, <coughs> excuse me and go from there, but it's not going to stop me. What's cool with these panels too, like I said, is it's designed to provide that homogenous layer. So whether it's Premiere or it's Resolve, I will show you anything with Resolve though. Resolve actually, for those of you who haven't played with it, Resolve has some really cool collaborative tools and it's got a really great collaborative workflow. It much more than just kind of color grading on that side. I'm, I'm really finding myself liking uh, Blackmagic uh, also kind of from a costing model on that side, because I can just buy it. Every month I get my Adobe bill and my wife asks me why I'm paying for it and I tell her why I need it. And we do this whole dance, it's crazy. But she lets me keep it. And I do like Adobe quite a bit as well. But we'll let Resolve load up here. And Evo can actually act, as you can see, as the database host for Resolve. So I can enable the collaborative features of Resolve using the Evo without having to have a separate server on that side. And we'll go ahead and just create a new project in one of these databases. Here, Resolve will launch. And then what we can do is use our workflow integration plugin to find share browser and find the same bin that someone may have made for us locally. Maybe they made it for us inside of the web app. Maybe they did it in the desktop. Maybe a Premier user made it for us. Doesn't matter. We're gonna pop in right here. We're gonna come over, we're gonna find our SIMPTY bin. And again, it's important to note, if I'm an editor, I know where the files are. I'm just going to go file folder structure, or I'm going to search, or I'm going to search by a frame rate and add stuff to my bin. In this case, I just happen to already have one. So we're going to grab that. We're going to drag it in and change our frame rate because I didn't set my project up correctly. And we're going to pop over now and find our metadata here in shot and scene. And often more important here in the keywords collection so that I can quickly sort those files. Show me everything that's sitting down onto my timeline. And away we go. Now I already have those proxies. So if I wanted to do this in an offline fashion, oh, where was this earlier? Oh, it's in my timeline somewhere. I would be able to attach proxy here in Resolve as well to accomplish the same workflow. It's actually up here. Let me play back. Use proxy media if available. So you would just link to proxy 
uh, down there, and you would have the same workflow you did with Premiere in a remote fashion. I told you before, it's not just one application, it's many applications and facilities these days. And I will tell you that the Premiere panels also support dynamic linking. So if I were to grab an After Effects project off my server and put it into a Premiere project, my motion graphics and composition would link to my Premiere project, or I could grab a sequence from a Premiere project um, back in on the other side. This is again what happens when you unmount volumes. Don't do that. Um, but I can pop open the Share Browser panel, which I would download through the App Store here, and I would get to my same bin. Or again, just do the file folder. So I'm sure I can just quickly search. Hey, show me everything that's. Empty. Now this is interesting. What I want you to see here, this demo two user does not have permission to some of the things in this particular bin. Uh, so here I'm searching the bin, not the volumes. Bins don't violate permissions. So Marty and Dennis, let's say you and I are senior executives and. We're making the big bucks and we created this cool organization with a bunch of confidential contact content in there. And we forgot we had it in a bin and we sent some junior editor a link to the bin. Well, if they don't have permission to where that content lives, they're not going to see it. They're going to get an error message. They may quickly ask a question as to why can't I see everything in the bin? In which case we can choose to be nice or a little firmer. It's a need no basis, kid. Or, well, you see, we've got these permissions things and we just don't need it. But either way, we can do what we need to do without worrying about violating those permissions. We don't have to think about it. The Evo thinks about it for us. So that's kind of how Share Browser works. There's a couple other really cool features in there that I'll save if we ever get to do demos with you guys separately. Um, some ways to control bandwidth and stuff on the network, uh, and other things. But next thing I want to show you here, we've looked at Nomad a little bit. We looked at Share Browser. I did want to show you in the admin interface over here, we can set up, that's where we would set up our read, write, reject, delete. We can also resize our shares. So, well, no one has ever told me, Steve, darn it, I have too much storage. They do tell me they need to reallocate their storage. And I'm trying to remember, it was Michael earlier that was asking me about when a drive fails and rebuilding, I think. Um, but uh, normally, if I want to repartition storage, I want to change the size of a partition, I have to destroy the data on that permission or on that partition to shrink it anyway. Growing it, I can always just add drives and grow the file system. And US certainly supports that. But our shares, our mount points, think of them more like root folders. So I can make this seven terabytes. And while the volume stays mounted, it's going to become seven terabytes for me there. For those of you rightfully saying it's seven and a half terabytes, not seven, Steve, you said seven. That's the difference between gigabytes and gigabytes. And I can go for three and a half hours on why it's dumb that Mac and Windows don't count bits the same way, but only one gets to be right. And mine is set up for Windows right now. Um, but I can shrink this back and let's make it two terabytes now. And now it's two terabytes. So not only can I resize these shares, I can do it while people are working. I don't have to kick them off the network. Hey, everyone, lunch break. I got to fix some stuff. No, just do it underneath them, reallocate to a new project, do whatever you need to do. What I really want to show you in here is NDI. I think my TriCasters are down at the moment. Let's take a look. Yeah, I don't have any sources. Normally, I would see all my sources here. I could grab whichever ones I want, move them over, and start capturing again directly to a location on the EVA. So that's how that NDI integration would look for those of you who are asking about the new tech stuff. Um, and there's some really cool macros that I encourage you to check out on the new tech website as well. But then Slingshot. So what Slingshot really is, is this. All right. So here's your scripts, here are your commands, JSON. We've got a lot of model scripts, things that people might use often to connect to other things. But as I told you at the beginning of this, I have a creative background. I don't know how to write code. I am not as smart as the engineers at all. I click buttons. So I come over here. And I can set up base level automations. I can say, okay, well, it's a QuickTime file and it goes into the templates folder. Let's come on down here and, oh, well, I need, maybe I've mastered out of ProRes 4K. All right, I want a ProRes 422-1080, probably not with an MXF wrapper if it's ProRes, it's a QuickTime wrapper. And I want that to be saved to the project share. 
And this next one might be an H.264 with an MP4 wrapper as a web deliverable or an MPEG with an MXF wrapper for broadcast playout. And notice these run these can run in a serial fashion. So first one becomes a 1080 version. Next one becomes maybe my broadcast playout. But now I copy the broadcast playout version to the playout server. And I can alert that playout operator by email. Hey, some file came in. What's neat about this is I don't have to give anyone right access to the playout server. You don't have to see the server. You just put your file into this folder or this share on the Evo. It'll get it where it needs to go and let the right person know. Uh, another one I really like in here that I use quite a bit in my own work at home um, is I auto delete a lot of my auto saves and scratch renders because otherwise those things stock, stack up and I forget. So I say like every seven days, it's in the auto save folder. It's got a premiere project extension. Eh, just get rid of it. I don't need it. It'll be fine. So if you think of user automations as things that kind of start on the Evo, think of replication jobs really as anything, anywhere. It could be, all right, this is great for backup. Let's do everything on the Evo. So again, across that cluster and the logical disk, however big we've made that hunk um, or that namespace or that file system. And let's say, well, if it's two years old, let's remove it from the Evo and let's go ahead and stick it in the cloud. Uh, we're going to keep that proxy, just like I showed you that you get to look at an offline volume. That cloud is going to appear as an offline volume. You're able to search it, tag it. And then this next thing that's really neat here, and notice too, this could be maybe I'm just going to move project files. This could also be from the cloud in a multi-site workflow. As I said earlier, it could be something as simple as, hey, I got this remote shooter. He's up in the Yukon territory hunting polar bears with his camera. All he's got is Dropbox. Let's go from Dropbox right down to the Evo. And again, alert me, do this kind of stuff after hours. Don't copy too fast. You can control bandwidth here. Um, but what I really like is aliases. So with most automation systems, what we find is um, there's a computer obviously is a logical device, right? So the automations I've shown you so far even were based on the files type, the files location, the files status within an automation tree in a serial fashion, um, or some combination of those queries, maybe the files age from the metadata, from the system metadata. As I'm sure you all know, in a creative workflow, rules and creative team members don't always jive. So whenever I say, hey, just put this thing in this folder and it'll do something, someone tells me, well, I can't put that file in that folder. That doesn't work for me. And aliases allow us to actually manipulate the user interface of share management. So they allow us to come in and grab a file and create the slingshot menu. And so not everyone necessarily has to have the same list of automations, but aliases are exactly what you would expect as an engineer. They're a shortcut to an automation. So they're a way to call that automation without having to necessarily conform to all the queries of it. So we just give you a button. Everyone can click a button, even me. So that's how that would work. Uh, on that side. And again, you can always do thumbnail view. This is a customizable interface. I can have my preview panel. I don't have to have my preview panel. If I'm dragging and dropping, maybe I don't want this to have to animate out. I can pin it. I can unpin it. All of this stuff is adjustable to the way our creative users like it. What I like to say is all of my clients make audio and video. None of them do it the same way. Not all of them like to organize their files the same way. They don't have all the same rules. So we very much provide you a framework of tools. And again, all of that's free. Uh, most of these, most companies will charge you per automation, not us. We have a very weird business model in 2022. We believe when you buy something, you should own it, not just run it for me in perpetuity. The other nice thing here is if you stop paying your support bill, it doesn't stop working. You own it. It'll just keep going. You don't need me to keep it running uh, on that side. Steve, how does... um. When when you're doing when you're using slingshot and you're doing stuff like transcoding or moving files, does that impact the editors? Or is it, it could is potentially it Dennis. Uh, there's a lot of rules we set up in the uh, admin UI to limit the amount of processors maybe used for transcoding to protect that throughput uh, and things like that. And those are customizable because again, you may if you have a hundred editors in an Evo, you may set that threshold a little lower because you're pulling a lot more throughput and processing because of your volume. But if you're in a smaller environment or a boutique environment with five or six editors, you may set that processor threshold higher because they're not using it. So you might as well let the machine transcode faster. 
Um, and all of these boxes can do all of these things. Now, certainly what you guys wanna do uh, if you're looking to design a system is check with us, check with one of our authorized dealers. We can help you pick the right ones because there are differences beyond speed um, within the context of the Evo product lineup. The internal components aren't all the same. So if you get smsevo.com here. By the way, there's some of our explainer videos, YouTube uh, I was showing you earlier in the news. Those are some, this is where you can find those customer stories and I can go by tag. So this is what I was talking about. I said, oh, I'm looking for collaboration. I'm looking for VFX. I'm looking for whatever. So you can kind of click in there. Actually, there's that digital tree uh, one I use the quote from. But within each Evo, there are different, you know, motherboards, number of cores, things like that. So if you're going to be really heavy transcoding, we may recommend a 16 bay online, even though you don't need the streaming speed, you'll just be able to use the processors more. If you don't have, you just need kind of a lot of storage, we may recommend the Evo Nearline, which isn't as fast as the online, certainly, and especially a large multi-editor, multi-4K environment. But if it's a one or two person environment, it's a much less expensive way to get our workflow tools and probably fast enough to do the edit. Or a lot of people use our Nearline behind, like that have legacy Avid online stores, right? They were an Avid shop. Maybe they still are an Avid shop. Uh, but they've also got some Premiere and some After Effects. So they'll bring our near line into that high res content. So you don't have to pay quite the premium um, that you do with some of those uh, fancy logos and face prints <laughs> on that side. Or don't have to pay for as many seats and connections um, of the asset management or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways to stack our stuff together uh, from that perspective. The other thing that's really nice here, and for those of you who have managed systems in the past, uh, SNS provides for the life of the product, a free basic tier of support. If you go off of your support contract with us and you call to get help, no one is gonna ask you for your serial number or a credit card. They're going to help you. And then they're gonna call a member of our sales team and your account manager and say, hey, this person's off support they're asking for, you might wanna see if they wanna renew. But you're, you will always get help. You'll never be told no. Again, that kind of comes from our uh, philosophy of being born out of a production studio. It is never acceptable if you're off air or you're going to miss a delivery deadline to have someone tell you, oh, I'm sorry, you haven't paid for your support contract. You have a credit card? That would never be okay. I'll also tell you we have a 99% customer satisfaction rating with our support team uh, through the Zendesk ticketing system. Actually, Zendesk is also a client, um, which is kind of cool to see them using video. Um, and our guys are trained on video and video workflows. Uh, they're also proactive. Tickets don't, if you open a ticket with SNS, if we say to you, hey, yeah, you said the speed was bad. We want you to check this thing on the switch. And you get busy because we can't check the switch for you. It's your switch or it's the workstation. We want to check this log on the workstation. If you don't get back to us in a couple of days, we're going to ask you again. We're not just going to let it go. So you're not gonna find that, oh, you got busy and you forgot, but that editor's still having a problem and now a week's gone by. Our guys are gonna bump you. They're gonna say, hey, just making sure you're okay. Did you get it figured out? Were you able to check that? So our support is incredibly proactive and engages with our client base, which is the probably, to be honest, beyond the technology, the most important part of any solution. You gotta have a company you can work with. You gotta have a company you can get on the phone, um, especially with the tight turnarounds and kind of mission critical nature of what SMPTE engineers especially work on. So guys, that's kind of a quick and dirty overview for the live uh, live demo. Any other questions? What'd you guys think? I'd love to hear some feedback. Marty liked it. Paul liked it. Is the only one gentleman brave enough to have their cameras on. Dennis liked it. I know Dennis likes it. He uses an email. Great job. Great job, Steve. Uh, keep in touch with us. Absolutely. Keep us up to date. Yeah. We do have some really exciting stuff coming out, yeah. you know, obviously around NAB, eh, if it happens. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to see all of you in Las Vegas, maybe one day. You're, you're uh, going? <laughs> you're gonna I'm be planning there. on it, but to be fair, I planned on going in October. I also planned on going in 2020. So yeah, <laughs> it remains to be seen. Very good. We'll Very see. Good. Well, thank but you again. All of you, to see all of you and feel free to sign up for our newsletter on the website as well. So you can stay up to date. And if any of you need uh, badges, certainly the uh, free passes uh, code should be coming out sooner than later. Um, 
but feel free to reach out to us on again snseva.com with that how to buy and i'll go ahead and drop into the uh, chat window here as well uh this would be we'll go with sales at studio network solutions um should i spell that right that's the best email address to hit us for requests and then i'll even give you guys since you know uh dennis and marty here i'm gonna give all of you my cell phone number as well as our mainline number to hit in so feel free to call me anytime day or night uh, i did used to cover asia pack for sns so i don't sleep as i'm sure you can see i don't know how big i am on your screens <laughs> um sleep is a novel concept for people in production and post so um yeah any other questions comments concerns well, i want to invite all of you to our next meeting which will be february 21st with matrox and we're going to do it in conjunction with the new york section as well we both wanted it so uh headquarters said why don't you guys get together so we did uh, should be very good. We're also working on another meeting, and I don't have the date yet. It could be February or March uh, on uh, what's happening with ATSC 3.0. It's getting closer. There, there are stations transmitting it. I don't think anyone's receiving it, but uh, it should be very, very interesting. So uh, we look forward to seeing you, and I thank uh, so many of you for coming tonight. And uh, Steve, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, I'm excited to see what you guys think with the Matrix. I've got some really cool capture solutions and ingest stuff as well. So I'm sure you guys will be in for a treat with that. And again, thank you so much for having me. Okay. I look forward to chat, seeing all of you in person. And then it's always good to catch up, Marty, as well. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night to all of you. Have a good one.